what is going on guys welcome back to the rant and review pro wrestling uh yeah i've been away over the past week some of you know i was in vegas for the week no it had nothing to do with wrestling it had to do with all the other things uh in my life which um yeah i may talk about it at some point in time uh because there will be some changes in 2023 uh it's for my social media presence but we are here to today to talk about this great crazy weekend a saturday that was quite eventful for the pro wrestling community we had of course full gear 2022 from all elite wrestling and we had a historic takeover from new japan and stardom a couple hours after that and there was a lot of stuff going on and a lot of kenny omega and we're going to get into some of that here in the video but before we get to that i want to remind you that youtube even if i'm away for a week likes this algorithm likes the like button and likes it when you hit it with a v trigger so go ahead hit that v trigger on the like button make it turn black or blue depending on what platform you're on it does help other people who are fans of all elite wrestling new japan pro wrestling and just the greater world of international pro wrestling know about this video and i appreciate it very much but let's talk about some of the big highlights from and some of the lowlights from saturday's crazy crazy action hey i got back less than 24 hours before full gear started so i came back from vegas i got everything kind of situated up and uh for I almost forgot what time it started i was like oh yeah it's on saturday not sunday so i uh got the pay-per-view and checked it out and i will say the pre the pre-show matches were the usual pre-show matches i did in particular enjoy ricky stark's match against brian cage i thought that was very well done and it, it kind of a callback because aew has been around for over three years now they are now able to do some of these things where you can kind of do callbacks to things in aew history now that there is an aew history of course brian cage and ricky starks were members of team taz in the past and you look again one of those complaints that a lot of people get what a lot of people had was why is brian cage not on aew well brian cage has been all over <laughs> aew for the past week uh, of course this also coincides with the fact that ftr was nowhere to be seen on this entire show but again these are complaints and things we'll have to talk about in a different video but as far as the show proper um this was a show of lots of ups and downs and i see the way the way the card was booked and how sony khan and the other people in the creative at aew were trying to pace the show and essentially i think it worked well although again the same problem that AEW shows are going to constantly run into is that they are very, very long. At a certain point in time, the crowd was exhausted, you were exhausted, and after five hours plus of wrestling, you get kind of burned out. And I think that hinders the main event match uh, in particular uh, on this night, and it's something that we're... AEW is going to have to do something about that. Um, because I think it does a disservice, even though you want to get everybody on the show, I think the length of the shows does a disservice to the main events, uh, matches on the show, the matches that happen at the end of the show, because the crowd is just tired and we're just trying to get to the conclusion. The problem with that is, is you might not be able to get these epic main events because the crowd is tired out. But let's look at some of the big things that I'm taking away from this show. One of them, I will say, as far as opening match shows on big shows and pay-per-views or premium live events, whatever you want to call them, um, the one on this show might be my favorite of the year. Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus in a cage match, which essentially is... It, it, that, that cage in AEW, by the way, is essentially the old Hell in a Cell cage with just without the space around the ring. I mean, it's a really tall, uh, really tall cage, but... This match was a lot of fun, and I think this was a big coming out party for Jack Perry, Jungle Boy, and it was the dynamic that, you know, I go back to, and I just mentioned Hell in the Cell because it, the dynamic of this was similar to Shawn Michaels and Undertaker, which was the first WWE Hell in the Cell match where you had the smaller pretty boy against this giant monster, of course, the face and the heel roles were, were changed here but they worked the match very similar to that kind of style. Luchasaurus was beating the crap out of Jungle Boy for most of this match. Jungle Boy bleeds early. Ironically enough, I will note this on this show too. There was not the usual, well, people have complained about the amount of blood in all the matches. They, they reined it in. And this was the only match where there was intentional blading and it was a cage match. So I, you know, I feel that's a good thing. I think they should stick with that. But Jungle Boy showed a lot of heart in this match. 
it did feel like this was his kind of Shawn Michaels coming out party where he, you know, when I, and I say that, I mean, when we found out in Shawn Michaels singles run that he wasn't just a pretty boy, that he was also pretty tough and he could work this rough style of a match. Even though he was a pretty boy, he could scrap and he could get busted up and he could get beat up and still come back and fight his butt off. That was this match. Uh, at one point it got outside the ring, Christian Cage gets involved, he gets taken back by security. But uh, Jungle Boy, on his own, managed to beat up Luchasaurus. And remarkably, and I love the way they finished this match because it actually made logical sense because I was watching the match going, well, if Jungle Boy wins this, it's not going to be believable. But the way they did the finish was believable that Jungle Boy would win the way that he did with the snare trap, got Luchasaurus to tap out. One of the better matches on the night and a great way to start off this show. Then we get to one of the more highly anticipated moments on the show, which was the return of the elite. And this was one match amongst a couple on this night where AEW, the fan base kind of was thinking certain things and the criticisms of AEW and the way things had usually gone in the history of pro wrestling in general, kind of dictated to a lot of fans to expect certain things out of this match. And this being the big return of the elite, all of the controversy with the whole thing from the all out fallout and all that stuff. Uh, a lot of people had pegged in that the elite were going to win this match, win back the trio championships that they never lost. And that because we had seen all this dissension between Pac and Ray Phoenix over using foreign objects or international op foreign objects as a foreign to the ring foreign objects in the, in the ring to win matches and Phoenix not wanting to do it and Pac trying to get him to take on his dark side that the story was obvious it was obviously going to be that the death triangle was going to split up and the elite were going to win the tag titles and probably go few people had already booked them to start feuding with the house of black well guess what none of that happened but first off, this match was absolutely amazing. The Bucks and and the, the uh, Lucha Brothers continuing their just history of having these wonderfully planned out spots that are exciting. Yes, they're choreographed, but they, the it's not in that it's choreographed. It's in the fact that these guys can execute the stuff that they do with the precision and the timing that they do. That is the appeal. I know there's some people you have to explain this to, but that is the appeal of their style of wrestling and they do it very, very well. Also, we got to see Pac and Kenny Omega, which again, AEW has some history to it now being around over three years. There's some history with the two of them. So this match, I think, again, another great match of the night. So we got two bangers to begin this show. Crowds chanting, this is awesome for both of these first two matches. Everything was going really well. I will acknowledge this too. I love the entrance. I absolutely love the entrance to Wayward Son. Uh, the elite coming out that was just the perfect song to have in this i that entrance i had to admit i was you know i was kind of like lukewarm on it i was like i don't know but i did get the goosebumps when they when they came on the screen and they were the silhouettes with them were there and they started playing wayward song wayward song i was just i they got me they got me on that one i cheered i popped for that one the match was fantastic but the finish is where we start getting into some interesting stuff with aew instead of what everybody has been predicting they were going to do and oh the elite or evps are going to book themselves and put themselves over they actually didn't and i think they did it in spite of the fact that a lot of people thought that the elite actually wind up losing this match do not win back the trio championships and on top of that you had Ray Phoenix, who everybody thought was going to, you know, Pac was going to break away from Death Triangle and all this stuff. After several attempts of Pac trying to get Phoenix to cheat with the foreign object, Phoenix does finally accept it when Kenny's trying to put him in the one wing angel, hits Kenny with the foreign object, the hammer or whatever it was, and gets the roll up and gets the pin on Omega. And the Death Triangle retains the championships. And Phoenix kind of looks like maybe he's coming around a little bit. Now, for those of you who watch Lucha Underground, there was a similar kind of storyline, not exactly, with Pentagon and Phoenix when they were in Lucha Underground with people trying to turn Phoenix dark or whatever. So whether they're not going with that, I, I like the fact that they're continuing that storyline and that there's we're going to get more out of this because... The Death Triangle storyline is one of the more intriguing things that AEW has been doing. I know a lot of fans don't give a lot of fanfare to it, but it definitely gets my interest. Then unfortunately, and I hate to say this, but I'm, I'm just gonna point this out o overall. The women's division at AEW still is its weakest link. Um, 
we had three women's matches on tonight. And again, this goes back to people complaining, well, why FTR is not on the show? Okay, FTR is not on the show. They already had a bunch of matches. You got three women's matches, though. You guys want to say, I was at the, the Dynamite in Baltimore. There was somebody holding up a sign that said, book more than one women's match. Okay, so they had three women's matches on the pay-per-view and a women's match on the pre-show. And of the pay-per-view matches, only one of them was good. This one was not it. Nyla Rose and Jade. Jade always has those great costumes she comes out with. Her presentation is amazing. She's still not really good in the ring. And her being with Nyla Rose, who's herself not great in the ring, uh, this match went on way too long. And I think this this is probably a booking thing that they're they're probably going to learn in the future. When you have two talents who are not the greatest in-ring talents but have a great presence, the match shouldn't be about them trying to do work rate. The match probably would be better served off. I'm not telling you how to book, but I'm thinking I, in my, for my personal opinion, I would probably have enjoyed this match more if it was a short five minute match. The, the old Goldberg Brock Lesnar thing, why that worked a couple years ago when WWE did that. Those guys cannot have a 10, 15 minute match that's based off of work rate and psychology. They need to just have bang collision. And that I think the Jade match with Nyla Rose would have been far better in my personal opinion, if it had been a five minute collision of them just hitting big power moves against each other and whoever hit the last devastating move won. Uh, they tried to do a little bit more work rate style in here. and I don't think it worked for the match at all. The crowd was lost in this match. It's of the first, first four matches on this card. It's the only one that did not get a, this is awesome chant. Uh, Jade does uh, retain the championship, gets her belt back from Nyla Rose, who had stolen it, and that storyline is now over, which was, I would say, this is the best Jade storyline and the best Nyla Rose storyline, honestly, with the two of them over the last month or two. The storyline was good. The lead-in was good. I enjoyed it. It was entertaining, but the match probably, in my opinion, again, should have been booked differently. We're going to jump ahead to the other women's match uh, and a big big match on this card Soraya, Soraya however you pronounce it taking on Britt Baker D M D uh, a highly anticipated match and you know that Soraya 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 wants to very much put the women's division on her back and show an example of how to work women's matches but she hasn't been in a ring in front of a live audience on a major show for five years so there was some ring rust in here it was very obvious uh she did do a little fake out at the beginning of the match as if she was hurt from taking her first bump and you even saw i don't know if Britt baker was in on the jerk or not because you saw Britt kind of was looking at there and i kind of was wondering if she thought that Soraya was hurt, but she was playing with the crowd and with all of us. Uh, don't tempt fate like that, by the way. That's that's living dangerously. Do not tempt fate like that, Soraya. Uh, the match wasn't great. It was okay. It wasn't a bad match, but it was just an okay match. Again, another match I think would have benefited by going shorter. They're trying to do the work rate style. I don't think that that played out in this match. Again, I think this match should have been centered around a couple of high spots probably five to ten minutes and get in and get out but again it's not my show so i'm not telling them how to book i'm just saying what i probably would have enjoyed a little bit more but again it's not to say that they did a bad thing the match was a good match it was a solid match on in some respects uh, a couple of botches here and there but nothing major soraya does get the win over Britt baker dmd uh, which you know i think it makes sense yeah you want some of the aew originals to get wins over these former wwe superstars coming in or whatever but i don't think this feud is is over it's far from over and i do expect that Britt baker will get her win back at some point in time in the future but to round out the women's part of the night let's talk about the aew women's championship match which was one of the best matches on the night and uh, clearly the best women's match of the night my goodness, Tony Storm, who is so underrated, and I don't think the fans gave her enough credit uh, as being a talent, and maybe some of that's part of her presentation. She has been getting better at promos. Um, I think she a, a second title run might be a little bit better for her in the future. But this match with Jamie Hayter, who everybody, the crowd was behind Jamie Hayter. A lot of times with stuff like this, you know, the promoters don't put the belt on them. They think it's too soon. But surprise of surprises, even though there was a lot of shenanigans along with it with, with uh, Reba, Rebel, and, and even Britt Baker making a, a shocking surprise run in, uh, it was Jamie Hayter picking up the win in a very hotly contested match that the crowd was into and I thought was performed very well. Jamie Hayter, well, a lot of people didn't think was going to win this match, does win and become the new AEW interim women's champion. I, I thought this was a great win for Jamie Hayter, and it does set up Jamie Hayter and Thunder Rosa 
little rumored backstage stuff. I don't know if it's true or not, but there's some rumored backstage heat there uh, when Thunder Rosa. I was expecting Thunder Rosa may, may have made an appearance on this night, but she didn't. Uh, but that is now the match I'm looking forward to in the AEW women's division. Plus, you got Athena who's working her new style. And when is Athena coming back up into the championship picture? Um, so moving parts in the AEW women's division. But again, this night, I think as far as that was concerned, showed that the division still has a long way to go. So again, a little bit of a swerve on the fans with the whole thing with Jamie Hayter winning the title when fans didn't think she would. A swerve with the elite losing the trios match that people didn't think they would and they thought that Pac was gonna break off uh, from the death triangle. That didn't happen. In fact, Phoenix moved more towards Pac and then we get the match for the TNT Championship, the triple threat, Samoa Joe, and who's the ROH TV champion, who's facing Will Hobbs, who's also facing the defending champion, Wardlow. And this one, a lot of people kind of thought Wardlow would keep the title or, or that Hobbs would get the powerhouse, would get the championship. But powerhouse uh, kind of took it on the chin a little bit here, even though he looked, they made him look strong for most of the match. So him taking the, the, the fall at the end of the match didn't hurt him too much, in my opinion. Um, I thought this match was okay. It was a fun match. Again, I think the big man style, they, they, I don't know if Mark Henry or, or Big Show can work with, I'm, I'm sure they're working with the guys, but maybe they should, I don't know. I don't know how their perception of big man style is. I'm kind of digging the way the WWE is doing their big man matches right now. I think AEW would, again, be well off to adopt that, to have it more, less work rate, more just car crash kind of stuff. Uh, you got some of that in this match too, which is why I think it was a good match. Um, but at the end, it was surprisingly enough, Samoa Joe does get the win. Warlow is going through his powerbomb symphony, which he struggled to get on Will Hobbs. Uh, and he hit the fourth powerbomb. And then Joe comes out of nowhere, knocks him out of the way, and just being the smart veteran that he is, locks in the clutch. And, uh, you know, at that point, <laughs> Hobbs was already out. So the referee, w Rinsberg, was just like, well, what am I going to do? Well, Hobbs is already out, so he rang the bell. It was like, that was it. So, it's just a brilliant finish there for Samoa Joe, really showing his smarts and the fact that he is the veteran over these two guys who are fairly new to the business. And Joe is now a double champion, double Joe, with the ROH TV championship and now the TNT championship. He's a double TV champion. I don't think, well, the last time I remember there being a double TV champion was, ironically enough, something that I'm gonna mention later, Nikita Koloff when he won the UWF and the N and had the NWA TV titles at Starcade 87. That's the last time I remember anybody being a double uh, TV champion in two different companies. So this was, uh, uh, that, that was pretty cool. I did not expect that. A lot of people did not expect Joe to win this match and have both titles. Where we're going with that one, I, I think I like Joe being a champion right now and Wardlow going back on the chase. And I think Warlow going back on the chase is going to be a lot better. So when he finally does win, because I expect he's going to win that TNT title again in the future. When he does win it back, if he can't take out Joe, I think it'll be better off. It'll be a better title win. No offense to Scorpio Sky, but it'll be a better title win uh, if for Warlow to win it off of Joe. Continuing with Ring of Honor, the Ring of Honor World Championship match was a fatal four-way. Chris Jericho, Claudio Castagnoli, Brian Danielson, and Sammy Guevara who was sneaking in there and uh, you know, the dissension was supposed to be between the uh, Blackpool Combat Club, but the dissension really was within the Jericho Appreciation Society. At one point in time, Claudio and, and Brian actually get into a, you know, a fight, and but they that's what they do. <laughs> that's the Blackpool Combat Club. They'll fight each other, they'll fight other people, they'll fight alongside with each other. They don't care, they just like fighting. That's their whole shtick. On the opposite side though, everybody in the Jericho Appreciation Society, given the name, is supposed to be there for Jericho. But Sammy, being Sammy, 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 who by the way, performed really well in this match, he told a great story with Jericho about the kind of the young buck trying to, pun intended, trying to come up against Jericho. And a, a few times I thought that they might've put the belt on Sammy. Um, a few times I thought they were gonna put it on Claudio. A few times they thought I thought they were gonna put it on Danielson. And this just goes to show, um, when you get three guys like Jericho and Danielson and Claudio who know how to work this style of match, 
you know, in there with a young guy like Sammy and Sammy sitting under this learning tree, Sammy Guevara is going to get way better from having this experience in this match in particular because this match, the, the way all those guys set up the spots in the different moments in the match and they let some breathe and then turned up the heat when they needed to, this was a very well done fatal four-way match. Uh, in the end, Jericho, who did a leaping Judas effect, barely hit Claudio and more wiped out Sammy. When Claudio was doing the big spin, he landed on Sam, but Sammy probably got his ribs crushed on that one because Jericho's pretty heavy. And then Jericho came back with another Judas effect, got the win, got the pin, retained the Ring of Honor Championship. Afterwards, he gets confronted by Orange Cassidy. We have then set up a match with Tomohiro Ishii this coming Wednesday on Dynamite for the ROH Championship. And then probably the funniest promo of the night, and I had to mention this, is Orange Cassidy. If you haven't seen it, Orange Cassidy and Jake Hager. And Jake going, what's in the bag? Orange Cassidy's like, pulls out the all Atlanta Championship. It's like, yeah, you want this? You like that? I like that. I like that hat too. And then we started going on about Hager and his damn hat. And that was funny. That, that If you haven't seen that promo, that promo is, that's the funniest promo of the night. The AEW World Tag Team Championships were on the line. Max Caster had, I would say, one of his better raps. He actually had some extra, extra bars he dropped on us tonight for the World Tag Title match defending against Swerve and Our Glory. Um, you do see a little bit of repetition here. It did stand out to me with uh, the, the whole thing with Death Triangle with Pac and Phoenix, and here with Keith Lee and Swerve Strickland where their one partner is kind of being shady and the more virtuous partner is struggling with the shadiness. And we saw how it resolved with, well, kind of resolved with Phoenix and Pac earlier on. Well, how is it gonna resolve here with Swerve Strickland and Keith Lee? This I thought was very well booked and very well timed. We did come in here uh, with Anthony Bowens legitimately having a bit of an issue with the shoulder. Uh, he did work through the match though. Bowens has been very injury prone. It isn't concerning with their tag team. Uh, but they worked through the match, and they, the match was perfectly fine. It again, I don't think any of the match, the rematches they've had, have topped the first match that they had last uh, at All Out, which I thought was the match of that in the night. They haven't quite been able to get back to that level of that match. But this match was more about the storyline, the whole thing with Daddy Ass, who wasn't out there, who came in when Swerve tried to take out the pliers again. <laughs> and try the scissoring thing it's so funny but the real story of this match was not really with the acclaim that really was and did come down to keith lee and swerve strickland and keith lee having enough of swerve and swerve having enough of keith lee not having his back and swerve actually slaps keith lee when he's trying to get keith lee to cheat and keith lee won't cheat and i looked at and the whole crowd and me and i'm sure everybody else who saw this like looked at swerve strickland like boy have you lost your damn mind just walked out of the rings like, all right, you, you handle this on your own. He left. He left Swerve by himself. Swerve then gets his butt handed to him by the Acclaim. The Acclaim get the win, retain the Tag Team Championships. The trilogy is now over between these two. The Acclaim win the set to the three uh, and retain the tag titles. And now they're going to be moving on. So now after this, the question is, where is the Acclaim going to go? FTR seems to be the one on the horizon. I also think the Gun Club probably in the interim you're going to see is probably something small with the gun club or a smaller tag team or probably with smart mark sterling or whoever else is going to, a, 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 a lower rung mid-card tag team is probably going to step up for the next couple of weeks um that might happen or they could just jump into the whole thing with ftr uh, Wednesday night's dynamite. We don't know, so uh, tune in to dynamite to see which direction they're going to take the acclaim. I think you can give the acclaim some breathing room right now in their tag title reign to let it go extend a little bit longer before they get into that FTR feud. Other notes here we also find out that the uh, AEW is going to be having a best of seven series with the elite and death triangle. So the storyline is not over. They're going to have a best of seven series, which I can only imagine how awesome this is going to be between these two teams and for those of you who haven't seen the best of seven series uh some people have referenced some the ones that stood out to me uh they'll always stand out to me obviously was, for me it's going to be back in the crockett days in 1986 it was the first time i ever heard of a best of seven series nikita koloff and magnum ta for the u.s championship which was which took the nation by storm back in the day a lot of people were buzzing about that best of seven match series the two of those guys had for a long time. And later on in WCW, Booker T 
and Chris Benoit had a seven match series for the TV championship, which was amazing. Um, there have been other ones. I think uh, some some people have mentioned a bunch of other ones, some in TNA, some in WWE. But I do think that this, which is a rare thing, you don't get between all the companies, you don't get a lot of best of seven series. They happen every three or four years at the earliest. So for AEW to be taking that on in their promotion, um, I think is really good. And I think that's the reason it, because it's such a long thing. You can't, other promotions are kind of going to stay away from it for a while because you don't want to get compared to this. And this is again, bringing in that sports aspect of wrestling that I love so much. So they've got all the matches lined up in this best of seven series. The match tonight, uh, the match the other night at uh, full gear counts. And the rules are quite simple. Whoever wins the most matches out of the series, winds up winning of course the series could end if either team uh gets to four wins uh whoever gets to four wins first wins the series and if it goes all the way to seven matches which we believe it will it'll wind up being i think it's a la show or a california show which is a big show for aew uh so yeah i'm looking forward to seeing a lot of this happening uh over the next uh, month or two in all elite wrestling so a, a good strategy there i am i am really digging Again, AEW is for wrestling fans. I'm a pro wrestling fan. This is going to be a great pro wrestling series. I can't wait for it. But now let's touch on the main event. MJF against John Moxley for the AEW Championship. Yeah, this by this point in the show, I was burned out. The crowd was burned out. They tried to get into it for Max. You can see the points in a, in a, in a match that uh, MJF was kind of expecting the crowd to react a little bit more, but they were just too damn tired, which is why I said earlier, I think the length of these shows ultimately can do a disservice to the main events. So maybe, I, I don't know how they're gonna do it. Um, I, I think there is an issue with it. You know, they're gonna have to make their decision about how they wanna handle their creative. Personally, for, uh, for me, um, I don't see, maybe shorten the pay-per-views by an hour and then on the same weekend having a big battle of the belts or the next weekend have a big battle of the belts since they're every four months as well, uh, every three or four months as well just taking four of those pay-per-view matches and making a giant battle of the belt show that everybody will want to tune into. So that's an idea. I don't know how that will work out. I think it, there might be an issue though uh, with people wanting the pay-per-view paydays. That might be kind of uh, the big deal there that you don't want to exclude too many people from those pay-per-view paydays. The main event match did suffer from the length of the show. Uh, Moxon and, and, and MJF wrestled a fine match. There was nothing really wrong with it. It is the finish, though, that everybody will be talking about. William Regal, and, and yet again, another swerve where we were kind of trying to figure out how are they going to get out of this? They've been kind of pushing MJF as the face, but Mox is the face, but they're in Jersey, so the crowd's more behind MJF than they were on Moxley. Moxley loved playing the heel for the first time in a long time. And it was a very strange dynamic in this match, but ultimately William Regal comes out when Max tries to use the diamond ring to get the win and cheat after two ref bumps. And instead of doing that, Regal turns on the Blackpool Combat Club or John Moxley, I guess, slips the brass knucks that he carries with him into the ring. Mox gets knocked out by the brass knucks. MJF gets the cover. One, two, three. Maxwell Jacob Friedman is your new AEW world champion, had a blistering uh, promo backstage in the post-media scrum. Um, I'm now excited to see where they're going to go of MJF. I don't even know who the next challenger would be for him. I'm sure some people could speculate on that, but we're probably going to find out really, really soon. Uh, and what is going on with Regal? Yes, MJF, I'm going to ask the question. We're all going to ask the damn question. What in the world is going on? What does this mean for the Blackpool Combat Club? which I'm kind of torn to that. I don't, I like Regal being in the Blackpool Combat Club. I like that dynamic, but maybe I might, and I'm gonna lament and mourn the fact that maybe he's not gonna be part of the Blackpool Combat Club. Maybe the Blackpool Combat Club might not exist anymore. That would be kind of sad because I like the faction, but I might enjoy MJF or William Regal a little bit more. Maybe I will, I don't know. This is all, I didn't expect it. I knew it was a possibility, but it was like on a low end of possibilities. But, you know, all in all, I thought uh, Full Gear was a pretty good show. It's not the best AEW show of the year, um, but I do I did enjoy it. It had some pretty great matches. There are a lot of great matches on the card. Um, the biggest highlights, again, Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus in the cage, the trios tag match, the Ring of Honor World Championship match, uh, the Women's Championship match. And uh, what went down between Swerve Strickland and Keith Lee. Those are the big highlights for me. And of course, the swerve of MJF 
uh, and uh, or William Regal siding with MJF over John Moxley in the main event and uh, MJF winning the championship. Now, a couple hours after that, New Japan had the historic crossover show with Stardom. Now, for context of people who don't really know this, New Japan Pro Wrestling is an all-male wrestling company. Stardom is an all-female wrestling company. Both are owned by Bushiroad. Uh, Japan, some promotions do have men and female rosters on their car but new japan and stardom do not they're exclusive they're exclusive by sex i'm saying sex and not gender because i'm not getting into that dumb shit. sex males and females so uh new japan so this is a crossover show where they're kind of merging the two but now we officially have female wrestlers in new japan pro wrestling because we are crowning the iwgp women's championship champ new champion at the end of this show uh, but I think, it, despite the fact, I know, let's just, I'll just get to that. Kari did win in a really great match. You should check it out. I know it's a pay-per-view, uh, so you do have to pay extra. You don't get this free with New Japan World, but it is worth checking it out however you can. If you choose to pay New Japan World, I would suggest doing that and not doing it any other way, guys. But no, you, you do you. Um, of course, the great Muda had his last match, which... It's kind of weird again. His last match in New Japan is a, a six-man tag match against the United Empire. He did get his kind of revenge on the great Okan. Uh, Okada won that match with the Rainmaker. Uh, again, weird that that's his last New Japan match, but his last pro wrestling Noah match, well, not his last, but on New Year's, he's going to be wrestling a pro wrestling Noah match against a New Japan legend in Shinsuke Nakamura, but it's not in New Japan. It, the pro wrestling multiverse is, is a weird place sometimes. But I think what a lot of people are going to be talking about, clearly, especially here in the West and in the East, too, because ja Japan loves this dude. Kenny, by God, Omega did make his return. I thought they were going to do this at the show a couple of weeks ago, but I did forget again that they were having this crossover show. And this again, like I said, it kind of played out the same way it did five or six years ago when Jericho showed up on the video screen to challenge Omega who was the U.S. champion and defended his title. Same scenario here. Uh, Will Ospreay successfully defends his U.S. championship against Shota Umino. And in the post-match, there's, ah, yes, everything's great. And then the lights go out and Kenny Omega is up on the screen. Uh, basically says, hey, I'm coming back to New Japan. New Japan called me and was kind of surprised. I wasn't really interested, but you know what? I'm going to do it one more time for the fans because the guy they got to replace me is a cancer and did he replace me the crowds are smaller you guys want to blame it on a pandemic but the real virus is will osprey and he is challenging osprey for the u.s championship at wrestle kingdom and in osprey in response you know both in the ring and in the post-match comments alluded to a lot of the history that goes on with this match a lot of organic history that makes the backbone of this match and uh it, you know again i suspected this we a lot of us who actually watch new japan have suspected this for a while now, there are a lot of people that had their thoughts on this match and what it should be and where it should be and everything else. I, th there are people who thought it should be in, in AEW. Um, most of them are the people who only exposure to Will Ospreay is from the Forbidden Door pay-per-view and the trios matches from the trios tournament. So, of course, then they think they should be booking the shit. So, one of them, <laughs> the worst one I saw was somebody who actually got into a discussion with me about how the match should be in AEW and it should happen in the UK for the All-Atlantic Championship and be country pride match, Canada versus the UK, kind of like Bret Hart versus the British Bulldog. And I'm like, huh? And of course, you know why this person does this, because this person's worldview is entirely, this person clearly came from a WWE worldview in WWE, WWE, WWE. So he's trying to book a Bulldog Bret Hart match uh, because that's their, his context of understanding wrestling history and knowing nothing about the actual history of these two characters and where the feud actually starts and you know you get it, we all know this who are new japan fans or in the west we get this thing from these people and they're like well nobody watches new japan even though we know there are a hundred thousand there there are a couple hundred thousand people in the west who watch new japan obviously in japan which is a country of 150 million people they have a large fan base millions of people in japan who watch new japan there are millions of fans around the world of new japan who know the history between will osprey and kenny omega i'm sorry for the people who don't understand and don't have the knowledge about the history of wrestling yes it sucks for you because you don't know any of this stuff that it's not booked for you but this was always a new japan feud 
the entire basis of the feud to explain for anybody out there who watches this video who might be pouting right now all of the history of this match is in new japan pro wrestling kenny omega and will osprey have met one time before in a singles match and that was in pwg way before either one of them started ascending as being stars in the pro wrestling world but there's the history and osprey brought it up about with the night that the elite left new japan at russell kingdom back in 2019 and on that night Kota Bushi got kind of hurt and when Will Ospreay debuted the Hidden Blade on that night when the Elite left and Ospreay made a mention that he couldn't say goodbye to his friend because of what Ospreay did at that show. Ospreay has been seen and I've said this for a while, New Japan was kind of positioning Ospreay to be the replacement for Kenny Omega when he left for AEW. Uh, at a point in time, Ospreay was trying to learn the language and talking about moving to Japan just like Kenny did. He always praised Kenny, he put Kenny on a pedestal. He mentioned this in the post-match interviews then osprey eventually decided to become his own man thankfully he did started the united empire and he's been carrying the united states heavyweight championship which is the championship that new japan invented specifically for kenny omega in 2017 to lead their western expansion here we are many years later and here comes kenny back challenging for the u.s championship very similar like i said to the way chris jericho ch challenged omega five years ago omega is now the one challenging the latest hot guy gaijin performer in new japan being will osprey osprey did kind of hint that he's probably not going to be in new japan a lot longer which is kind of sad to hear you know him talking about the you know his time with new japan might you know not, not be long he said maybe i'll stay maybe i won't i th i think for all of the people again for all the people whose only frame of reference is western wrestling maybe you'll be happy because osprey might wind up in aew next year but outside of that <laughs> will osprey doing just has been busting his ass for the last two years during the pandemic era to make new japan relevant in the pro wrestling community delivering all of these match of the years and it's been an ongoing thing between the two of them i'm excited to see this match for me it's this is the main event of wrestle kingdom even though technically it isn't but it is i would say the match i'm looking forward to most at Russell Kingdom 17 and has put this Russell Kingdom now up into that level of feeling like a big Russell Kingdom that we've had for the past several years when you get a big huge marquee match like this that means a lot not only to Western fans because we know you know Kenny Omega and a lot of people are now getting comfortable and becoming aware of Will Ospreay but for the Japanese New Japan fans in particular Kenny Omega coming back facing off against Will Ospreay at the Tokyo Dome at Russell Kingdom? I hear it's not supposed to be a cheering event. I don't know how you're gonna prevent that, that crowd uh, from cheering, uh, seeing that match. That match, I mean, you might wanna just sign match of the year <laughs> over to them <laughs> before it happens. You shouldn't do that, but if, if that match does not wind up being in the top five matches of 2023, something will have to go terribly wrong for that not to happen. Um, so that's what you need to know about that. So Kenny Omega's back, the elite are back. We've got a lot of crazy stuff going on. We've got a new IWGP Women's Championship and a new champion in Kyrie. Uh, a lot of moving parts now. We're heading into the fall, the two winter, December. A lot of it's gonna be focused in New Japan on World Tag League. AEW's got winter is coming, literally. Um, and what's gonna happen? Who's gonna win between Starks and Ethan Page to challenge for the AEW Championship against MJF now? Keep in mind that's happening. Uh, we've also got the trios, uh, best of seven series, a lot of cool stuff happening in the international pro wrestling world. So I want to know what you guys thought about this. Let your voice be heard in the comment box below until next time. I will see you guys here as I continue to cover the world of pro wrestling and sports entertainment on the rant and review pro wrestling. Have a good day.